This is our session on innovations in financial inclusion, literacy, and development. I'm Aslı Demir Güçkunt, uh, Director of Research at the World Bank, and I will be the first speaker and chair this session. So we will each speak for 20 minutes, and then this will hopefully leave some uh, time for you to uh, ask questions and make comments at the end. So I want to start by setting the stage. Um, so uh, we at the World Bank have been prioritizing financial inclusion for quite a while. And um, the reason we do that is, of course, uh, we believe that financial inclusion is uh, very important to achieve development outcomes. Now, um, in uh, most uh, development theories, uh, inability to access financial services is the reason why poor people cannot escape poverty. Uh, without access to financial services, they cannot invest in uh, their health, they cannot invest in their education, they cannot uh, take advantage of uh, promising business opportunities. Again, uh, without access, uh, it's very difficult to uh, manage uh, financial emergencies. So um, inclusion is extremely important uh, to be able to escape poverty and promote uh, shared prosperity. Um, now, uh, it's not only theory, uh, there is growing empirical evidence coming from rigorous field experiments, and some of which you will hear about today, uh, that uh, individuals, especially the poor, benefit from basic um, savings, payments, insurance services. Also from microfinance, particularly for uh, individuals with existing um, microenterprises. And uh, digitalization has been playing a very important role in all this. Uh, and there is uh, quite a bit of literature, as I mentioned, which uh, we have summarized in many of our uh, papers, survey papers, and there are many others as well. So um, uh, today, though, I want to talk mostly uh, about uh, data um, in setting the stage. Um, now, generation of data on financial inclusion is obviously important for us to be uh, to better understand and study uh, this uh, issue. But also, it's extremely important in policy because measurement helps uh, focus policy attention. Ever since we started benchmarking financial inclusion, um, over 60 countries uh, have really developed uh, financial inclusion strategies with formal uh, targets and policy frameworks. Um, so uh, this ha we've seen how much impact this has had on uh, the policymakers, how much uh, awareness this has raised. And uh, the, the remainder of the panel will be giving you more evidence on innovative research on inclusion, literacy, and consumer protection. Okay, so um, let me go to measurement. Now, uh, we, um, ever since we started working on access to finance and financial inclusion, which is uh, over a decade now, uh, leading up to the UN year of microcredit in 2005, we noticed that uh, despite the fact that data are very readily available in the financial sector, often in high frequency, when it came to answering questions like what's the proportion of adults with a bank account around the world, it was very difficult to get consistent uh, answers to uh, these types of questions. So initially Initially, what we tried to do, we tried to piece together data from the supply side, uh, you know, bringing together uh, figures like bank branch penetration or ATM penetration with the limited household data we had in order to impute these uh, types of figures. But of course, this was unsatisfactory. Finally, um, in 2011, we were able to launch Global Findex in collaboration with Gates Foundation and Gallup Corporation. And this is a uh, database uh, measuring financial inclusion based on interviews with all 
almost 150,000 adults in over 140 countries worldwide, covering over 97% of the world's population. And uh, for the first time, this user side database allows us to measure financial inclusion consistently around uh, the world and also over time because we do this every three years. And um, of course, uh, the fact that it is an individual level database also allows us to see to what extent uh, what subgroups like women or uh, the poor are excluded. Um, as well, and uh, uh, Global Findex has been quite uh, effective in allowing us to track financial inclusion, and it's been used uh, by policymakers and the development community. So um, today I'll give you a little bit of highlights, but please do uh, go and look at our um, background paper as well as the database that's uh, available, all the data is available online. Um, Okay, so what do we see? Um, one of the highlights from this data is that financial inclusion is on the rise. So when we first started doing this in 2011, we saw about half the world's adult population globally had a bank account. And for developing countries, this is about 41%. Uh, now, after having done this in 20, uh, 2014 and 2017, the latest figures is that uh, globally uh, we have 69% um, of the population with a bank account, and uh, for developing countries uh, we have 63%. So certainly we have seen an increase, and there has been progress. Now, the different shades of the, the map over there uh, it does tell you, though, of course, there's quite a bit of variation still around the world. And um, around half of the unbanked uh, in the world live in seven countries, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, we've seen also a very significant uh, advances over the last three years, for example, in India. Account ownership surged from 53% um, to 80% in just three years. Um, so, so one thing that jumps out uh, looking at the data is that digital technology is driving access to and use of financial services. Uh, we've seen the importance of mobile money account ownership in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, for a while now, and over the last uh, three years, this has gone up from 12% to 21%. Um, and the mobile money spread from East Africa to West Africa and beyond. In Bangladesh, Iran, Mongolia, Paraguay, share of adults uh, with a mobile money account has reached 20% of the population or more. So it's become really important. Um, also, technology uh, has an impact on the use of accounts, making it much more easy to use these accounts. Obviously, use of accounts lags ownership of accounts. Globally, about 20% of account owners have inactive accounts. They haven't deposited or taken money out of uh, their accounts over the last year. Uh, in the developing world, this is 25%. But in some regions, we see that this is much higher. For example, in South Asia, uh, in India, 48% um, of accounts are inactive. But we also need to put this in the context because we know that uh, there has been a very um, large increase in ownership of accounts over the last three years. So it takes a while to catch up. And in this, technology is really helping. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, the share of account owners sending or receiving payments digitally increased globally from 67% to 76%. And in the developing world, this, is, this has gone up from 57% to 70%. And in China, 57% um, of account owners use mobile uh, phone to pay bills or buy things. Uh, this is up from 24% the last time uh, we measured. 
but um, not all news is good. Um, there is a persistent gender gap that we see. Women are less likely to, than men to have a bank account. Globally, 72% uh, of men have uh, an account, whereas 65% um, of women do. So the seven percentage points have been persistent. It was there when we did it in 2011, again in 2014, and uh, in 2017. And um, this gender gap in the developing world is about nine percentage points. And again, it's been persistent. Now, um, not all countries suffer from this, and some countries have been making advances. For example, India, when it's uh, experienced the surge in account ownership, um, uh, the gender gap fell from 20 percentage points to 6 percentage points. Similarly, Indonesia has been seeing much more equitable growth in account ownership, and most recently, women are doing slightly better than men. But then uh, there are countries like in Bangladesh, 65% of men have an account against 36% of women. And in Algeria, 56% of women have an account, but only 29% of women do. In my country, thir Turkey, there is a 30 percentage point um, gender gap. So this is an area that we will need to be working much more on. Um, now, uh, there are, of course, other gaps, too. Um, um, uh, for example, income gap, 13 percentage point gap between uh, the richest 40 percent and uh, uh, poorest 60 percent exists. And again, yeah, that's been persistent as well. Um, uh, we need to do much more research here to be able to understand this better, but anecdotal evidence suggests that, again, technology uh, may be able to help reduce these gaps. For example, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, men are twice as likely as women to have a bank account, uh, yet women are just as likely as men to have a mobile money account only. Uh, in Kenya, uh, men are 18 percentage points more likely than women to have a bank account, but women are 11 percentage points more likely than men to have a mobile money account only. And in Kenya and Zimbabwe, poorer adults are more likely than wealthier ones to have a mobile money account only. So all these figures uh, give us hope that uh, technology will be able to uh, promote uh, more equitable uh, inclusion, and uh, obviously uh, we need to uh, do much more work to understand exactly how. Um, if I want to leave you with one picture that captures uh, the promise of technology, it would be this one. Uh, globally, about 1.7 uh, billion adults remain unbanked. Um, now, 1.1 billion of them, two-thirds of them, actually have a mobile uh, phone. So uh, we hope that uh, next time we do Global Findex, we are going to see some of this promise realized. Um, all right, so um, uh, our database actually is useful also in showing how digitalization can promote ownership and use. Uh, for example, more than 200 million unbanked adults uh, receive agricultural payments in cash, including 140 million who have a mobile phone. Um, similarly, paying uh, government wages, pensions, social benefits directly into accounts could bring formal financial services to up to 100 million unbanked adults globally. Um, again, there is uh, 200 million unbanked adults who work in the private sector who get paid in cash. So bringing these payments uh, into accounts uh, would certainly increase um, ownership of uh, accounts and bring uh, people to the formal financial system. Also, digitalization um, can uh, really give a boost uh, to use of accounts. For example, more than a billion banked adults make utility payments in cash. Uh, and these include 800 million who have a mobile phone. So clearly, you can see the promise. There are lots of low-hanging fruits here. Um, 
Okay, so uh, now that you've seen the, the global picture, I want to turn to my panelists uh, to give you much more flavor on individual research projects. Um, our next speaker will be Ana Maria Lusardi, who is a chair professor at George Washington University. She has done path-breaking uh, research on financial literacy, and today she's going to be talking about financial literacy of millennials and how they engage with the fintech smartphones in the U.S. Um, then, in the order of the speaking, uh, the second speaker will be Xavier Ginet of the World Bank. He's a lead economist who's done significant research on access to finance. And uh, today, he is going to tell us about his research on consumer protection in Mexico and Peru. Our third speaker is Leora Clapper. She is a lead economist and the co-founder of Global Findex and has been managing Global Findex from the very beginning. And she's going to tell us about her uh, latest research on innovative savings products in Ghana. And last but not least, we have Jonathan Murdoch, who is a professor of public policy and economics at New York University. And he is the grandfather of microfinance. And uh, today, he will tell us about his research on the impact of mobile banking in Bangladesh. So we hope to give you a, uh, a tour around the world as to how financial inclusion is uh, shaping up and what's the best way to promote sustainable financial inclusion. So let me now turn to Anna. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and to be part of this uh, panel. I have to say um, there isn't a single project, in my view, that has been as important as the global FINDEX uh, data. Uh, with that data, I think we have been able to uh, have uh, information on such an important topic, which is how do people and can people participate to the financial markets? It was impossible before, and I think it's really because of the leadership at the group at the World Bank that we have been able not only to get the data, but this data has really shaped policy in the world. And that's why I really like the title of this session today, How Can You Change the World? Well, you really need uh, good data, you need uh, evidence um, to be able to suggest good policies. And I'm very fortunate that I was able to, in collaboration with Leora in particular, uh, connect uh, in one particular year to that data and also add information about financial literacy. So because of the global FINDEX data in 2014, we have been able to add a section on financial literacy. And for the first time, and I have to say only for that time, we, only, uh, we also have data now on financial literacy around the world. And that data as well, I think, has been very important to shape policies around the world. There are now 70 countries that are uh, doing or having a national strategy for financial literacy. And I have to say it has influenced the policy of my own country as well, Italy which in 2017 has set up uh, actually a financial education committee in charge of designing a national strategy for financial literacy, and I'm very, very happy as well to chair that uh, committee. So what I want to do today um, is indeed uh, set the stage uh, to talk about the importance of financial literacy and technology uh, by uh, connecting to what Asli just said, to the fact that financial inclusion is really on the rise, it is important, but I would say it's not enough. First of all, we, haven't, you know, we need to do more because still a lot of people do not participate to the financial market, but it's also important for those who participate to have the tools and the skills to be able to take advantage of the opportunity offered by the market. And because today fintech is so important and is perhaps even substituting the traditional financial services, we also need to have a look closely at the importance of fintech. 
Here is another area where we didn't have data. Um, so in 2017, we have uh, collected our own data on FinTech use, and in 2018, we repeated this survey, and so I'm also going to talk about some of the recent work we have done on FinTech, in this case, just in one country, the US. So let me actually give uh, just a preview of the project that we have done, linking to the global Findex data. Uh, all of the information is provided in this report, which uh, uh, is a joint project with Leora Clapper. Fortunately, we were able in 2014, in collaboration with the team at the World Bank, to link the global Findex data with a small module on financial literacy. We only cover uh, five questions uh, on four topics, and we define financial literacy if people know just three of these four topics. What we are really measuring here is the ABC, basically, of financial literacy. Do people know those fundamental topics? Uh, remember, we had to ask the same questions across countries as different as Italy or Ghana or Brazil. Uh, and so we had to look at these fundamental knowledge, uh, financial literacy knowledge that applies to every country irrespective of their economic structure. And we give like a passing B in uh, kind of my class. If you know kind of 75% of the questions, just three out of four, you are financially literate. But again, we are looking at, you know, very, very basic question. And I want to repeat here for you kind of uh, the graph that as we did when we look at the global uh, FINDEX data, but this time is again the picture of the world uh, looking at the financial literacy knowledge, uh, where the darker areas are where people know more, actually just a little bit more than half are financially literate, meaning they know three or the four questions. And as you can see here, just very few countries have this dark shade. So unfortunately, and you know, a little bit mirroring uh, the, the in financial inclusion, not many countries, even countries with well-developed financial markets, have a population that know this basic concept of financial literacy. It might be hard to capture or like to see this in the data, so let me give you, for example, just the ranking of who knows the most or who knows the least. As you can see at the top are Countries like the Nordic countries, the U.S., which is one of the countries with the most developed financial market, in fact, only 57% of the population is financially literate. In Italy, only 37% of the population. So we have a long way to go. But I think this list also indicates that it's not because you are born in a country with, a high, with highly developed financial markets that people are financially literate. You know, people don't acquire financial financial literacy just by breathing the air. You really need to do more and probably to be more proactive when it comes to financial literacy. Uh, I also want to mention which are the topics that people know the most and the least. Uh, and here what I want to highlight is that is the concept of risk and risk diversification which around the countries is what people know the least. And this is important because when you approach, of course, finance or financial decision, risk is an essential component. Yet this is what uh, most countries are really lacking. Um, and I also want to show the distinction in financial literacy across age group and also across two types of country, the G7 country or the major advanced economy and the BRICS countries. Because what you can see here is that while there is a regular ham shaped profile in the major uh, advanced economies, meaning the young and the old are the one who know the least, Actually, in the major em emerging economies, we see that instead are the young who know the most. And I think this speaks of the opportunity also of technology. People could actually learn or technology can provide great opportunity for the young and perhaps the young are already using this opportunity uh, for their own financial knowledge. And here is uh, another important finding of the data, which is there is also 
a gender difference in financial knowledge, in the same way in which we do see a, a very large gender difference in financial inclusion. In my view, this gender gap might be driving the difference in uh, how many women versus men have bank account and is really an important topic to address. In Italy as well, we, have, uh, we are trying to pay a lot of attention to this gender difference um, in financial literacy and in the use of bank account, which is very important and very pronounced. So why is this important? Because when we look at people who do have accounts, so for example, um, we have linked here the uh, financial literacy data with the global FINDEX data. You see that even people who own an account are not financially literate. So unfortunately, having an account but not knowing even about interest compounding, inflation or risk diversification might, might put you at risk of misusing that account or not using it to the, your own advantage. And this is true uh, not just around the world but even in the advanced economy. The same when we look at borrowing. If you look at people who use credit cards or have borrowed at a bank, we see yet again that uh, many of them do not have financial literacy, putting again potentially at risk of not using this account well. And this is true even for an important um, financial investment, for example, the house, and even in countries which are well developed. So if you look, for example, at people who have a mortgage, and uh, are really financially literate according to our definition, do they know the ABCs? Actually, as you can see, many of the country have a high proportion of the population which is not financially literate, and yet again, Italy here kind of stands out as a country where uh, there is indeed a very low level of financial knowledge. So this is important. Um, and, and I think we really need to complement this improvement in financial inclusion with uh, improvement in financial literacy so that people can use or can participate in the market to their own advantage. Let me turn now to the opportunity that FinTech offers. Um, so of course FinTech has become very important and to be able to study the importance of FinTech uh, we have been adding questions on the use of technology in our most recent survey that we are doing with the TIA Institute. Since 2017, we have been collecting data each year on uh, use of fintech. Uh, and uh, in 2018, we have specific questions about this in our survey where we oversample millennials. So the data I'm going to provide now is only for millennials and is only about the US. The millennials is of course a very important generation. They are going to be the largest, uh, in a sense, labor market participant and they are the generation most, uh, that use f uh, FinTech the most. Um, what is our personal finance index? This time we, do, we are not looking anymore at the ABC of finance. We have devised a very thorough um, measure of financial knowledge, as many as 28 questions over eight areas of knowledge of what people in a sense need to have in order to uh, manage their own personal finances. And what I want to show you first that in the US as we have seen in the previous uh, graph, the level of financial literacy is not very high uh, and is particularly low among the millennials as well. So even if you look at more sophisticated measure of financial literacy, the same finding applies. Now, um, we have looked at eight different kind of measure of fintech and I'm going to focus now just on mobile payments. So people, do people basically use their phone to make all kinds of payment? And I'm going to look at whether they track their amount they spend or what they spend on, again, using technology. In other words, a transactional activity, where, by the way, we see the largest expansion, and instead an informational activity. Do you use, for example, your mobile, pay, your mobile phone to track what you spend, and so on. And what you see here, that among the millennial, there are basically 40% who use their phone to make payment, 
and 67% are actually using their phone to make, uh, to track spending. Now, you might imagine that, you know, people who use technology are smart, informed, and they do the great, and they really use the technology perhaps well. You know, we were a little, in a sense, skeptical because we do know that people do not have high financial literacy. So how are the one using technology doing? What we do find, unfortunately, and if we look at even the simplest, in a sense, transaction, so using your bank account, the people who use mobile payment are also the one a lot more likely to overdraw their checking account. And this is actually true even for those who track spending. So if we just look per se at the use of technology and you use them, they are not necessarily the more savvy one. And there is actually a correlation, a very strong correlation with financial literacy, meaning that those which have high financial literacy are at least less, less likely to overdraw their checking account and are also less likely um, to track the spending in a way that is not good to them. Even when we do the regression, we find that the mobile payment, uh, so using technology, is not associated with good and wise financial behavior, but financial literacy actually helps, meaning it makes that behavior to be a little more savvy. Uh, and this is important because we also uh, saw from other data that financial literacy is linked to all kinds of uh, better and good behavior. So um, this actually finding is very uh, similar to another survey we did in 2017. Again, these are only correlation, not causations, but I think, again, it speaks of the fact that in order to use technology, take advantage of the opportunity of technology, we also need to have uh, to improve the level of financial literacy. Let me close, indeed, with these comments, which is that, unfortunately, financial literacy, in the same way in which financial inclusion is not high enough, um, and we really need, in a sense, to improve the level of financial literacy around the world. FinTech has great opportunity, but even as another paper will show uh, today, you know, we also need to find ways in which the use of FinTech is really better and improved. Um, and so overall, my message is that to improve or to really make difference in the world, I think it's important to make improvement in financial inclusion, in the use of technology, and I think we can do so by also improving the level of financial literacy around the world. This is what we can do for the greater good. Thank you very much. All right, um, good morning. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, present uh, in this panel. So this is joint work with uh, Christina Martinez and Rafe uh, Mazur. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, how the format in which information is disclosed can have big impacts in uh, good financial decision making, okay? So, so we know that financial markets are basically characterized by, by, by two, main, uh, two main aspects. One is there is substantial price dispersion even when you take the first, in, even when you take the same individual, being offered, uh, being offered products at the same time. Okay, so this individual will face, um, you know, huge price dispersion. So take a credit card, you know, you receive a bunch of offers within the same week, and there, there's going to be, for the same kind of product, there's going to be huge, huge dispersion. Okay, we also know that even in this, in this environment of substantial price dispersion there's also very little comparison shopping. So uh, if you take, for example, uh, mortgage buyers in the US, most of them will have, will have just looked at one lender, okay? So they, they don't go out and seek, and seek information, okay? Now, um, so, so there's been several solutions to, to, this, to this issue. One is financial education, right? So we could improve financial decision making uh, by offering programs uh, and enrolling people into these kind of programs, but basically the evidence has been so far mixed. Another uh, way to tackle this problem is to introduce legislation to improve actually disclosure and, and transparency, and this is what, what we wanna focus on, okay? So starting in 68, the US 
uh, enacted the, the TILA, Truth in Lending Act, which basically required that consumers had to be informed about APR and APY of the product uh, that they were purchasing. So Peru and Mexico, the countries where we're going to do this study, uh, introduced similar legislation in 2005-2009. Uh, but basically, even now, there's still this price dispersion that suggests that basically these disclosure modifications were, were not that effective. Okay? So a lot of these disclosure regulates uh, or dictates what terms should be disclosed but not necessarily the format in which these terms should be disclosed, okay? So one example that actually also regulates the format would be the Schumer box. Uh, this, you know, for those of you that have credit cards in the US, hopefully you've seen that, where it basically lays in the same spot the, kind of, you know, the different cost of, of, of the credit cards, okay? Now, uh, the problem with only regulating uh, the content but not the forms, the formats, uh, is that basically, um, you know, financial providers uh, basically have interests that non, may not necessarily line up with those of the with those of the, of the consumers, and so that leaves us with forms and and, and inf uh, information disclosures that are typically difficult to understand and that are not easily easily comparable. So let me give you an example. So in Mexico, you have to report the uh, the APR. Okay, so these are brochures, marketing brochures. And by the way, this is pretty much what people use and receive to make financial decisions, okay? About 50% of, of, of the sample that we're gonna be working with use this and, and conversations with the, uh, with, with the staff, with the, of the financial provider, okay? So, okay, so these, these uh, brochures have to disclose the APR, very clear where the APR is, you know, very prominently featured, okay? It's somewhere there, you actually need a magnifying glass to actually look at it. And as you can see, you know, these are you know, very different products with, with actually fairly expensive uh, APRs, okay? So what we wanna do with this paper is to try and understand the role that more transparent and, and, and simplified formats might have in improving financial decision making, okay? We're gonna do this in the context of a lab experiment. I will tell you uh, why we do that in a lab experiment uh, later. Um, so what we do is basically we, we use the capital cities and their surrounding neighborhoods to recruit people. These are low-income subjects from the streets. Um, uh, and then we, you know, basically we do, a, we do sessions. So we gather 20, 20 of these uh, individuals. Uh, they're stratified by gender and by, by education. But basically they come from low-income low -income places. Um, and then basically, again, we put them in a session. The session lasts between one, one and a half to two hours. And in these sessions, they're going to have different rounds. And in each round, basically, they'll have to choose uh, the best product according to a, to a, according to a profile that, that, that we'll give them. But they'll have to choose the best product. And the products will be, uh, the information about the products will be shown in different formats, in different ways, okay? Um, okay, so... Uh, in Me so these, these guys, of course, you know, they don't do it, uh, you know, out of their goodwill. They're paid for this. So it's important because we pay them to have their undivided attention when making decisions, okay? Um, so in, in Mexico, they're paid $16, $16 in the, in, and, 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 and also depending on how well they do, how well they, they, they decide, they can actually win uh, additional, additional money, okay? In Peru, they were, they were paid similar amounts, okay? Um, so this is how a session looks like. I mean, these guys are basically, you know, sitting in a room and, and making decisions depending on how the information is being provided, okay? So, um, so what is the task again? So we're gonna consider two financial products, a, save, a standard savings product and a credit product. So uh, for the savings, you know, they're given a fictional endowment. And again, they have to choose the best three products out of five, okay? Um, and again, they have this profile, okay? So, so, so they're randomly divided into two profiles. Profile one, consumer have to make one in inquiry at an ATM, one deposit and one withdrawal uh, each month. Uh, in profile two, uh, they have to make two inquiries, two deposits and two withdrawals. The difference here is, is that, you know, depending on uh, the, the product, you could have, you know, you could, have you could face different prices depending on, on um, on where you do the inquiry, where you do the, the transactions, and the number of transactions, okay? For credit, 
um, they basically had, uh, they had to choose uh, the best three loans of a certain amount, uh, and these were going to be loans of, uh, you know, 12 months, uh, monthly installments, okay? And here the profiles differed into, so one, profile one, basically you had perfect repayment. Profile two, you were basically missed one payment in, in, any, in, in one month, but then you paid in full in the, in the following. And so we wanted to see this because, we, so we, we vary this because, you know, APR, when you look at, you know, if you miss a payment, APR is not going to be enough, okay? So you'll have to see uh, what other fees might, might apply uh, in deciding what, what's, the best, what's the best product. And by, and by the way, when I mean best product here, I mean, you know, in, for loan, for credit, I mean the cheapest product, right? And for savings, I mean the one with the highest, uh, uh, with the highest yield, okay? Uh, in Mexico, uh, similar, uh, similar profile. Uh, so some statistics. Um, so, uh, so basically, you know, these, these guys are, 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 fairly, um, are fairly poor. Um, although, you know, Peru, even though it's a cheap, even though, sorry, even though it's a, it's a poorer country, the sample's a bit, uh, is a bit, is a bit richer and a bit more educated and a bit, it has a bit more um, uh, familiarity with, with financial institutions. Um, so when we asked in Peru, uh, you know, what percentage basically had compared uh, if they had had uh, a credit or, or a loan, uh, about a third, less than a third actually said that they, that, that, that they had compared. So this is really a sample that, that's really, uh, you know, would be active in the, in, the, in, the, in the market, in the financial market. And so it's a good sample to, to, do, these, uh, to, the, to do this experiment on, okay? Um, okay, so, so uh, um, I talked about this. Uh, so these are the, the different treatments or ways of providing information that we used, okay? So in, all, in both countries, uh, one way of providing information was through these marketing brochures that we've seen, okay? Now, if, if that marketing brochure did not have all the information that we wanted to convey, we simply wrote it in a, in a piece of paper, which is actually something that the staff of the financial institution would also do, okay? And we compare that, so of course, so clearly, I mean, what we want to compare here are the different ways of presenting the information. Of course, you know, it, it would be very unfair to, you know, to not provide the information and then have, have individuals make decisions when, when some information that's critically uh, important is, is, is missing, right? So, so marketing brochures is one. The other one is a simplified uh, key, financial, state, uh, key, key fin uh, financial statements, which, which I'm going to show you uh, what that is. But basically, it's kind of like a Schumer box where all the information so the same information is always presented in the same place, and it's it's uh, you know it's highlighted if it's if if it's relevant. Uh, these these simplified key fact statements differ a little bit between countries because actually we work with the regulators to actually come up with a design. Okay, so there was a lot of back and forth as to as to what um, what um, you know how 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 they should be how they should be done. Um, in Mexico and Peru, because of the because of this work with the regulators, they wanted to test other other fee, other. Um, uh, other ways of disclosing information. So in Mexico, they wanted to look at some comparable tables. In Peru, uh, they wanted to look at also uh, the impacts of uh, key fact statements that were that were designed by the providers. Right? Remember that in these countries, you know, the regulator says, okay, you have to rep you have to disclose this, but then then it's left to the providers, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the format and how that's done. And so they wanted to compare the market design. Uh, you know, in, for this talk, uh, given that the time is limited, we're out, I'm only going to focus on the marketing brochure, the comparison between marketing brochures and the simplified key fact statements. Again, the, simple, the marketing brochures is pretty much what they, what they're, you know, if, if they get any, anything, this is the kind of information that, that they'll get, okay? So this is a marketing brochure from Peru. We've seen one for, for Mexico. And this is what the key fact statement kind of looks like. Um, so let me, so for Peru, for example, um, you know, you have the, the TEFEA is basically the APR. Uh, sorry, yeah, this is in Spanish, but anyway, uh, you guys, anyway. Um, okay, so, and then uh, in the top right corner, we have how much you have to pay in soles. So that's the currency, so that's the amount. I mean, so there's, there's some evidence suggesting that if you put stuff in percentages, people understand it less than if you put it in actual currency. So you have how much you gotta pay of the credit uh, without, uh, you know, if you if you make all payments or if you miss a few payments, uh, it's 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 uh, it's below, and then also the the, the installment because that's that's uh, that's important. Okay, so again, if this information was missing uh, from the brochures, we would write it out in in uh, we write it out in the in the in the brochures. 
Okay, so some more stuff. Uh, now for savings. Um, um, so notice actually that in Peru, uh, in Peru, um, you actually have how much you would gain uh, or lose, uh, you know, if you started off with a certain with a certain balance, with and without activity. So with uh, with with or without making some some transactions. Now in Mexico, regulators did not want that. So this is Mexico. You don't have how much. Uh, how much you're going to win or lose. You only have uh, interest rates. And so we'll see that for savings, this might be driving some of the, some of the results. Okay. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to run simple regressions. Uh, everything is randomized. So first we're going to look at you know, whether or not they choose the best product uh, with a, using a dummy for whether or not the format that they've seen is a simplified one and, and also controlling for the profile. So whether, whether the profile was one or not. Um, and this, you know, this is clustered um, at the session level, includes country fixed effects, okay? So what we see basically for credit is that, you know, again, these are the same individuals making decisions about choosing the, the best financial product, just looking at information different, looking at different information, okay? Uh, so, um, and so what we see is basically that simply showing the simplified format improves the probability, increases the probability that these guys will choose the right product by 23 percentage points, okay? It's the same individual, okay? We also collected data um, uh, about financial literacy, and we find that do, financial literacy does improve uh, the, the probability that, that they will choose the best product by 6.6 .6 percentage points. Now, you know, I don't want to make a big deal out of this because this is not causational. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's financial literacy. It might be correlated with a lot of other characteristics of the individual, so, so you know, take it with a grain of salt, but, but, but at least, I mean, you know, just comparing the, co the coefficients, you know, the simpli just the simplified format, so showing a format that's standardized um, and it's, uh, it's simplified basically, uh, it's, you know, increases the probability by three times compared to financial, compared to financial literacy. And these are the same, you know, this, for the same guys, okay? Uh, sorry, no impacts for savings, uh, again, part of the problem might be that for, for, for the, the, the simplified format in Mexico uh, did not have, um, did not have, um, did not have the, the how much you make uh, in, in, in amounts, whereas in Peru you, you did have that. Okay, now we ask them to choose to rank the first three choices, okay, one, two, and three. So basically we can, we can use a ranked order logit uh, and the nice thing here is that we can actually add the price, okay? So we can start looking at price sensitivity. Uh, and later we can then compute the price elasticity. So, so the question here is, does the format make you more or less price sensitive? Okay? Uh, so do you respond more to prices, uh, uh, you know, depending on how you see the information? Okay? Um, so here are the results. Um, so indeed, uh, you know, more expensive products are less likely to be, to be chosen, uh, but the simplified format, at least for credit, has a huge impact, okay? So, um, so, uh, and so, so if you look at the interaction between simplified and the cost, right, um, if, if, I'm shown, if I'm shown the information with, uh, with you know, with a simplified format, um, I, I will respond more to prices, okay? Financial literacy also, also helps, um, Let's look at what happens um, with the price elasticity. So basically, um, you know, if I increase the price by 1% uh, and, I'm, and I see the information with the brochures for credit, uh, I'm gonna reduce the probability by 1%, okay? However, if I'm looking at a format, if I increase the price by 1%, I will reduce the probability by, by three percentage points. So it's three times as large uh, when, so the, the price elasticity is three times as large uh, in absolute value, when I look at when I when I when I look at the information, uh, when I make decisions using the simplified form as number sure. What's also interesting is what happens with financial literacy. So so basically, if I'm shown the brochures, and I'm financially illiterate, um, I am basically there. You know, prices makes make you know I'm completely in, insensitive to to prices. Okay, so basically, I don't understand anything. Okay. Um, if I'm financially literate and I'm shown the brochure, I, I, I do have some price sensitivity, uh, 1.4, okay? However, with a simplified format, even the financially literate individuals are making very, very, very good decisions. So, 
So the simplified format, in a way, is correcting the differences coming from the, the, the financial, financial, financial literacy. Financial literacy. Okay. So, so in a way, you know, the simplified format is actually um, is actually helping more the financially literate uh, than the financial literate. Okay. For savings, um, uh, for savings, um, uh, there's there's basically no no difference in part driven by 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 Mexico. Okay. So let me let me wrap up here. So what we what we've seen is basically that the simplified key fact statements improve decision making when compared to market brochures. This is especially true for for uh, for credit um, and financial education does help. But basically, the effect of the format is is actually four times as large. Okay. Um, now let me so so let me conclude with some caveats. So clearly, this evidence comes from the lab rather than the field. Uh, so um, now the advantage, of course, is that you know we we, we increase sample size, right? We, we you know we pay people to make decisions, and so we have at least when they're looking at this at these formats, they're make they're making you know they, they, we have their undivided attention. Okay. Now typically in the field, you know people face competing demands uh, on their time on their attention, and so so it's unclear that 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 these decisions would would carry through. Um, uh, but basically. Um, 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 you know, we could see this approach uh, by regulators, and in fact, they're, you know, they're, they're being used as, as a way to test out products, and if they work in the lab, then, then they can tra try in the field. If they don't work in the lab, then they might as well forget it. And so this is something that the CFPB here in the U.S. and, and the Fed, for example, have been doing, have been doing for a long time. And, and, you know, with our work with regulators, we're trying to encourage this, uh, this approach of testing out things. In fact, in Mexico, we're doing uh, something related, you know, for the credit cards, uh, credit card statements, uh, to, uh, you know, we're following this approach. Take it, in the, take it in the lab, and if they work, then, then, then test them in the field, okay? The other thing that one can do with a, in the field, with a field experiment, is to, is to see not only uh, consumer responses, but also how firms actually respond to, uh, to greater disclosure requirements, right? So, will they change the the, the products? Will they make it uh, Will they make it more competitive, right? Does this greater financial disclosure will lead to uh, lead to more um, uh, more competition? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, um, um, now another thing that regulators could do is basically require lenders to sell to send product information in a machine readable format so that it could be downloaded. Uh, and then used by startups like Comparabien or uh, Rocket LA or, or here in the U.S. like NerdWallet um, to basically, uh, you know, provide, uh, provide, you know, comparative information in a digital way and therefore reducing substantially the cost of, of shopping around, okay? And one last point uh, that we, of course, in a lab experiment couldn't look at is the fact that, you know, the timing of when information is provided is critical, okay? If you're provided information you know, when you're signing on the dotted line, when you're when you contract the, the product, that's going to be too late, right? I mean, information has to happen when people are making decisions and choosing among among providers. Okay, so so that's something that that in the field one can one can what could see, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, but but the enforcement of this is is important. And with that, I'll I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. So many years ago, I got back a referee report from a top journal that said, financial services are a luxury good. Why are you suggesting that poor people should be buying Mercedes? And at the time, we had no answer. Um, but I'm, as I'm going to show you, um, uh, we've slowly, we're building the evidence base, study by study. Um, we're building the evidence base to better understand what is the real effect of having a bank account um, or an account at a mobile money service provider? Is there any benefit of having your money in an account rather than under the mattress? And as you see here, there are a number of studies uh, from around the world in Africa, Asia, showing that having an account, especially for women, it gives uh, adults a safe place to keep their money and gives them more control over the money as opposed to having their money in a wad of cash that can be taken from a family member 
they, having your money in an account literally gives, a, uh, especially women, a more comfortable seat at the table on how the money's spent. So for example, there are uh, studies showing that having a bank account is related to greater household spending on education, on health care, nutritious food. In a study in the Philippines shows that women who have an account to save their money, are more the household's more likely to buy goods that matter more, perhaps, to the woman, such as a washing machine. We also see um, increase in investment in businesses, increase uh, access to insurance products uh, and credit, increases yields of farmers. In a study that I'm doing with Martin Cans and Emily Breza, that will be out very shortly as a working paper, um, we're looking in Bangladesh at garment factory workers who are moving their wage payments from cash to paying them directly into an account and finding, for example, that their savings more than doubles that rather than send the money home to the villages to be saved with family members, they're saving the money themselves. And this is a bigger question, um, a follow-up question. And does it matter whether we pay people in cash, wages, government transfer payments, domestic international remittance payments? Does it matter if we pay people uh, cash versus paying them directly into an account? And this is also relevant even here in the US where many states are still paying unemployment and welfare payments as checks, which are frequently cashed out at uh, cash checking uh, locations and brought home and saved under the mattress. And so here too, we're seeing a growing evidence base um, that electronic payments um, for the sender, for example, an example in uh, Bangladesh, where we quantify the time and the cost savings for factories that rather than bring in trucks of cash and literally close their production line for days to dole out the money, that paying them into an account is tremendous cost savings to the factory. Um, the, for government payments, there's evidence in Niger and elsewhere that making payments into an account is not only cheaper and safer for the government, but also reduces leakage, makes it more likely that the intended recipient receives their money. Um, in Afghanistan, after the police officers were paid into their account, they realized that they were losing up to 10% of their own payment because of that cash was disappearing before the payments were made. Um, we also see, so in addition to uh, greater security, lower costs, greater speed, we're also seeing an impact on risk management. In Kenya, work by uh, Jack and Surrey, showing that people who use mobile money payments when an emergency hits, they're more likely to get help from a wider both geographic and social network of friends and family. And finally, it's also a first entry point into the financial, formal financial system. Being paid into an account not only uh, 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 allows you to access additional financial services that bank may provide, savings products, insurance products, the payment history is increasingly being used as an important source of credit information to, uh, to uh, judge future ability to repay loans and access appropriate credit. So just to uh, follow up on um, Asla's presentation of the Global Findex data, just to give you a graphical idea of uh, the opportunities. Um, so first, can electronic payments, the opportunities to simply access, uh, increase access to financial services? Here we're looking at the size of the dot, are the number of adults in millions who are paid private wages in cash, who are unbanked and receive their private wages in cash. Increasingly, these are workers uh, who work for global value chains. In Indonesia, for example, there are over 30 million unbanked adults who are paid their wages in cash, increasingly working for garment factories and other private sector players. We also are interested, here we're looking sort of the flip side. Um, what are the opportunities to increase usage of financial services by people who receive electronic payments? And where the paper I'm going to uh, deep, uh, dig, uh, uh, dive into a little bit further uh, 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 places. And so here we're looking at the number of adults and millions who are paid government wages into an account. In Ghana, for example, where I'll be talking about, about 5% of all adults, over 700,000 adults, are paid government wages into an account. And so now we can ask the question, what are the ben other benefits? What other products would be useful? And so in addition to useful products, another um, opportunity of those paid into an account is often access to an overdraft facility. 
We see in Ghana is the vast majority, or 80% of adults pay, uh, in our sample, government workers paid into their account, are using overdraft facilities on some regu regularity. And so what do we know about short-term debt? Um, we know that people around the world are using it, often at very high interest rates. It's good. It helps you uh, smooth consumption over unexpected medical shocks, death of a family, a, a wage earner. But however, often these are very expensive, and the burden can often trigger further financial distress. We know that people often borrow informally to repay these formal loans. And then I guess the ugliest is a risk of the negative consequences, digging deeper into the debt cycle. And so the puzzle is, um, why are people getting into these debt traps? Why don't people save to, um, in, to, uh, instead of uh, borrowing? And so one opportunity, and here again, it's because of the electronic wage payments, because the money is uh, deposited directly into an account, is the opportunity for a commitment savings product where money is drawn automatically. It doesn't require any effort on remind, remembering on the behalf of the uh, saver. Um, and so the traditional thinking, the literature, is that, and to put that in words, it prevents impulse spending. Right? And so if the money is taken out uh, immediately and put into this commitment savings uh, product, you, can't, you don't have access to the money, it uh, becomes illiquid, and it forces us save for the future. However, you have the risk of naive agents um, not signing up for enough or too little commitment, um, especially, and in this sort of unique case of where the uh, savers have the ability to borrow, to crowd out their commitment. And most of the previous literature related to commitment savings um, was done only using administrative data on the savers. And so we didn't have the complete financial profile of the adults, especially the ability to look at how they were using uh, changes in debt and borrowing to compensate for that savings. So the other reason that liquidity constraints might help uh, the savings, uh, why commitment is important, are the psychological barriers, especially in Africa, especially for women, where money is often um, at risk of being taken or stolen by husbands, mother-in-laws, etc. Um, I've actually had the pleasure to pilot the Findex data in over 30 countries, and in Ghana, we met with a woman who I saw a half-built home outside her house, and she told us that every week she gives a the builder a few dollars to add one brick. And so I asked her if she was moving, and she said, no, my husband can't drink cement, which is probably you know, a literal example of how these illiquid savings products can keep money from becoming liquid. Um, and so we also have this question of who benefits from these commitments. Um, are they the people who have the most difficulty savings, who are most likely to um, overcompensate with additional debt or not? And just as a sneak, um, so in this paper, we have a randomized control trial with government workers in the northern Volta region of Ghana. Um, as I said, most uh, participants have liquid savings. Over 80% also carry some debt, mostly in the form of overdrafts. They receive their salaries directly into the partner bank, um, have access to this very costly overdraft facility, and most are in a debt cycle. On the first of the month, their salary pays off last month's debt, and they very quickly borrow again to get them through the next month. And so our treatment is a commitment savings product for 18 months, and the hope is that, so um, at the end of the 18 month period, you get the, a bonus, the equivalent of one month's savings, which on average is about equal to the overdraft facility outstanding. And so this is an opportunity to pay off your outstanding uh, debt, get out of that debt cycle by savings over this 18 month period. And so just to give you a bit of a punchline, we actually find that the people who are most likely to borrow, the people with the naive uh, uh, planning, are least likely to benefit from the product. So uh, we find that our study participants, mostly middle class teachers, civil servants, they save, they borrow, they report having challenges paying their bills. Um, we find, so this overdraft is an interesting uh, product Regardless of when in the month you take it, you're billed a flat rate. And so effectively, what many people do is they get themselves almost to the end of the month, but not quite. And so by borrowing towards the end of the month, there's an incredibly high um, implicit APR. 
meeting an overdraft or incurred about 100, uh, about 226 uh, GHS in annual fees the year before our intervention. Um, and we stratify our randomization of who we identify, uh, if you see the figure, figure above, as above below the median overdraft index at baseline. This is our proxy for the present bias. Um, our partner, the Northern Volta Bank, we called our product the Susu Plus. Susu um, is a guy on a moped who comes to your house daily, takes, collects a dollar a day, and gives you back the money at the end of the month, um, less one day saving. So it's an expensive product. And again, when we asked women in Ghana who had bank accounts, why are you using this Susu product? You know, what was often reported was um, that uh, it was just inconvenient. It didn't make sense to travel every day to a bank to deposit a dollar or two. Um, but uh, um, so they use these expensive Susu products. But here we're now offering them um, the ability to have this money auto deducted from their account. Um, they get to choose the amount for 18 months. Um, it's released after the 18 months. The ability to early withdrawal, um, and the goal is to reduce the overdraft. It's a very popular product. We had over 70% take up, very little uh, dropout rate. Um, however, over heavy overdrafts are more likely to drop out. Here's our timeline. We, um, uh, we uh, ran survey rounds, three rounds of data collection, plus daily administrative data, both before and after our intervention. So we do see a uh, persistent impact on savings. The red line above, and you see the dotted, the dotted line is the uh, time span of our intervention. Um, we see persistent impact on savings even after the intervention, on average. The effects in overdrafts are quite transitory, and we don't see much effect uh, long term. Our empirical strategies are in COVA. Um, so here's our first uh, finding. We see that during the treatment, we see a big impact on savings um, at the uh, NVRB bank, our partner bank, both using administrative and survey data. However, we're also seeing an increase in debt. We're seeing that people who in the commitment savings are offsetting the savings using their overdraft facility. Um, we also see that heavy overdrafters, um, shown on the right, are drawing down their savings even before the end of the treatment. And so we're finding that treatment uh, crowds in savings for the light overdrafters. So those who at the baseline less likely to uh, draw an overdraft um, are increasing their savings on average, whereas the heavy overdrafters um, are crowding out the savings. And even more dramatic impact after accounting for debt, um, as you can see in the last column, for uh, heavy overdrafters, um, the net debt actually increases. Our treatment effects appear reasonable. Um, and so to discuss, you know, so what is going on? Um, how do we explain our um, findings? Um, so it's, uh, well, let me just go to the next slide. You know, so what are the mechanisms? Why do we find the surprising finding that for light overdrafters, we actually see a crowding in of savings even after the treatment's over? For up to a year later, we see a crowding in of savings above the commitment. Um, you know, maybe one explanation is habit forming that these are adults who see the benefits of savings, perhaps especially on um, psychological uh, pressures at home, having the money in an account, relieves the pressure to bail out family members or friends. Um, we also may see people who are now closer to their goals. Um, if they have a goal for a large purchase, be a new moped, a generator for a side business, they're getting closer to that goal, which would require longer term study. Um, and in, uh, so to conclude, um, like in other work, we are seeing our savings of partner banks increase during the commitment period. Um, however, we do see this uh, binary effects, that for heavy overdrafters, we see it actually very costly, suggesting importance of considering um, access to credit, um, ability to get out of liquidity uh, commitments when designing the product. However, among light overdrafters, we're seeing you know, big benefits, uh, persistent benefits, especially even crowding in of savings. And again, I think this asks uh, questions for further research on the crowding in of the savings. You know, can the savings be addictive? So, thank you. Good morning. It's lovely to be here. 
Um, I, I want to start with a correction. Um, Asla introduced me as the grandfather of microfinance. <laughs> I, I think what she meant is that, you know, I'm getting older, kind of closer to being a grandfather. Yeah, and I have spent a lot of time thinking, learning, and following microfinance, um, like a lot of people. Um, but, you know, what's interesting from that perspective, having followed financial innovation and what Oslo started us off with, right, financial services as a way to address poverty and reduce poverty, it's interesting that so much of the conversation is really about things which look very different from microfinance, payments technologies in particular, um, and we're now trying to figure out how these new technologies address, um, address poverty, address inequality. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. One of the big reasons that we're talking about payments, all of us in different ways have been talking about payments, um, is of course technology. But there's another part that I want to put um, on the table to start us off with, and that is a massive demographic shift that's happening globally, and that's really urbanization. There are a number of demographic shifts that are happening. Fertility has fallen. Um, age structures are shifting so that there are more adults in the population. But with that, we're seeing urbanization at a scale which is um, unprecedented. You can see from the 1990s, when I started looking at microfinance, um, you know, the populations, especially poor populations, were predominantly poor. And now you can see um, the urban population is rising from just over 2 billion up to just over 4 billion, so from 43% to 55%, the world is now predominantly urban. That's an incredible shift. And in terms of financial services, it really changes possibilities and strategies. So when we think about rural poverty, back in the day, we used to think, and we do still think to some extent, about interventions that provide better financial services in rural areas, if we're trying to solve rural problems. So microfinance is one, more intensive um, interventions like graduation programs, ultra-poor programs that you may have heard of um, that combine grants and training together with finance, and then human capital um, interventions, all driven by the idea that poor households have um, potentially high returns to capital, low returns to labor, um, and so trying to expand markets to address these problems. But the payments technologies that we've all been discussing um, this morning suggest a different strategy, a radically different strategy, which is to physically move out of rural areas or for at least some part of a household to physically move out of rural areas into cities where they can earn more, have different kinds of income, more stable income, and then remit back. Remit back to rural areas. So we can, so Leora is describing this as a, um, you know, a question of what's happening in, to factory workers and others in the city. What I'm gonna look at is what happens to their families who are back home in villages. And in some sense, as I sort of think about the grand landscape of financial security, and we're thinking about liquidity problems, we can think about people who at one level have steady income and expenses, so they don't really have a lot of shocks to deal with, and they also may have strong coping mechanisms, good access to, um, to capital and financial services, and they're basically doing okay. Right? And then we worry, all of us, about a group that is exposed to shocks, exposed to difficulties, and also unprotected or doesn't have financial access. And if we think about a household that's in that cluster, really what I'm talking about is not just having a household member or members move out, but move out physically, um, but also move out to a part of the space where there's better access to finance and better access to jobs which are steady and provide higher wages. That's one part of the equation. The payment side then closes the loop and brings the money back into rural areas. That is the, um, the idea that I want to present and give you some evidence today from a recent study in Bangladesh. This study is with Jean Lee, Saravana Ravindran, who's on the market this year, Abu Shantroy, and Hassan Zaman. And what we did 
was to focus on a set of villages in north um, West Bangladesh, which are particularly poor. These are villages that have historically suffered lean seasons, hungry seasons, where people don't have enough to eat. Um, the life, economic life is precarious. But at the same time, the capital city, Dhaka, which is that big um, circle in the middle of this map of Bangladesh, has been growing. As Liara was saying, factory jobs are opening up. Um, Bangladesh's growth rate's actually been impressive the last decade. And what we see is households moving from places like the Northwest, Gaibanda is the area, um, to Dhaka, to the middle. So there's a net in-migration and net out-migration um, from places like Gaibanda. So what's going to be interesting methodologically about the study I want to describe is that it's a randomized control trial, but it's a randomized control trial in two sites. So we're, we're going to randomize access to payments and mobile technology in Gaibanda, but also to family members who are in Dhaka. So in order to think about how we connect these ideas, people moving and then moving physically, and then money moving back digitally, we're going to start with a group of villagers who have been trained by an NGO called GUK that is set up to help train young people, adult members of families, um, to move to um, Bangladesh and get work in the factories. Okay. And from that sample, we're going to introduce mobile telephone technologies um, to those who've already moved to Dhaka and to the families back home. And we're going to be building uh, on the Bcash um, mobile platform. For those of you who are following mobile um, technologies, you probably know the story of M-Pesa in, um, in Kenya, which has sort of exploded and then has been replicated in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh, um, Bcash, um, with some competitors now, has been growing incredibly fast. It's got about 80% market penetration. It's got around 30 million customers, very, um, very large, very uh, sort of well-liked and trusted. It provides a number of different services. The main service that people use is, um, is payment services. And Bcash presents itself as a useful device for doing exactly what we're studying, which is for factory workers, like this woman in this ad for Bcash, to avoid all the hassles and insecurities of sending money back to villages um, by simply doing it um, by digital technology. The problem with that concept is that the villagers don't have access to Bcash. And that's the part that we're trying to solve. And then we want to see what happens when they get access. So the benchmark, right, what happens before Bcash, what was the world like before then, was one in which if you wanted to send money, you had a number of different options. They weren't particularly secure. They were fairly expensive. You could travel by bus, take a day off from work, actually two days, because you have to take a day to get back to the villages and a day back, um, and physically take the money um, back, to, uh, back to Gaibanda up in the Northwest. You might ask a bus driver who's going to take the money yourself. They'll charge a fee, and it's not always so um, reliable. Or you can um, now use Bcash. So we did some focus groups, and roughly what we're seeing is a reduction in the price of transferring money. So we ask about a 4,000 taka, Bangladesh taka um, transfer, which is about $48. Um, if you go back yourself, it costs about $12 to transfer $48. What Bcash does is, is take that down to $1 for $48. And with that, with that price reduction, which is more than that, it's also an increase in security and um, flexibility and timing, comes a number of different possible implications. Right? You re reduce prices, you can expect to see more activity, more movement, bigger remittances. As Liara was saying, you might see more insurance um, possibilities with timing effects, um, more investment, et cetera. And that's what we're going to look for. What I just want to highlight about this sample is that they're 
in the Northwest, they're very poor. In the capital, they are factory workers. Um, but these are households that are generally too poor for microfinance. What we did to encourage activity and use of, um, of this technology, which did exist in the countryside, but this population wasn't using it because they were too poor, was to, do a, to run sessions um, under an hour where we describe this Bcash technology. And because the Bcash technology runs on English language menus, this population, which is basically illiterate and innumerate, had a huge hurdle to adoption. We translated the menus. We gave hands-on experience using the telephones. Um, and in that way, and also helped facilitate um, take up. This English language menus has been a huge hurdle um, and a big reason why, while Azla's sort of describing the people, the potential of mobile banking, um, there are still a lot of steps um, to actually realize that possibility. So this costs about $12 um, in both sites. We did this in, in the city and in the countryside. And what we saw across a year um, was extremely su sort of surprising and impressive. When we started, about 20% of the sample had adopted um, Bcash. They were you know, the most aggressive, most interested in this, 20% um, in the control group. But by doing this simple one hour hands-on exercise, we took that up to 70%. So from 20% up to 70%, a huge increase in take up simply by overcoming that barrier. And when we say from 20% to 70%, we mean active use, not just signing up, but having at least one transaction um, every month. That um, increase was both in the urban areas and the rural areas. And as we predicted, not only were households then using this technology, but remittance flows were dramatically um, increased. Remittances are a big part of this sort of economy, right? Adult children are moving to the factories in order to work hard and send money back to their parents and their um, siblings about 30% of migrant or factory worker income is being sent back. And what we saw was that there was an increase above that. Remittances increased by about 27% when we just looked at kind of mobile money and the treatment. And we, when we looked overall, what we saw was for active users, a 30% increase in remittances. And this was not displacement of other remittances going into mobile money. This was an increase in total remittances across the board. What this meant in terms of the share of income that was moving was an increase from about 20% to 27% um, in um, the share of migrant income that was rising. So here's a technology that's very disruptive and creating possibilities and moving a lot more money back to the villages. So what did it mean for the villagers? Now all of a sudden, these very, very poor households, these ultra poor households, um, one might say, um, have more resources. And poverty, extreme poverty, starts to fall. Right? So simply having access to this um, led to a decrease in extreme poverty. These households are so poor that the, kind of, the less extreme poverty actually wasn't affected very much but a decrease in extreme poverty, and with that, increases in general spending, decreases in calorie deficiencies, uh, even outside of the hungry season, and so weak effects, really negligible effects on education and health. Okay. The other part of this, as money's coming in, we see less borrowing on the part of households back in the villages, right? Now they've got their own money. They don't have to go out to the money lender or others to um, get high price loans. These remittances are large relative to the amounts that they were borrowing before. And so we see greatly reduced incidence of needing to borrow or the amount borrowed. And we also in see increased saving as households now have resources uh, to hold on to. 
Not only that, when we look at the hungry season, the lean season, the number of households that say they don't have problems in the lean season has now gone from about 8% up to 17%. Right? So simply having this technology and being better connected to children or other family members working in the city has really changed um, the precariousness of a lot of the households. The last effect um, that, we're, that we see in the villages is a labor supply effect. We see more self-employment. We also see more migration. Now that the money's coming in and the networks are created, more household members are going out themselves, and that has um, knock-on effects. So this is the story of a simple technology that we're all starting to get our minds around, which has the potential to really change um, how the advantages of growth are diffusing through economies. But there was an important downside that we hadn't expected. When we look at the urban migrants, the ones who are in the factories who are now sending more money back home, they're having a harder time. They're facing more pressure because of this technology. And we see, in terms of self-reported health, both emotionally and physically, worse conditions in terms of how they say that they're doing. So it's a good reminder that technologies have the potential to really change and enhance life, reduce poverty, as we've seen, reduce hunger, very elemental changes. And yet, they also bring other kinds of pressures and change relationships in fundamental ways. So the bottom line is as we think about these technologies and we think about the possibilities for payments, it's not just about creating better services for people where they are, but it also creates possibilities for changing and building on these two big uh, disruptions that are happening throughout the world. The movement of people in unprecedented ways and also these possibilities for the movement of money. Thank you. Wow, great papers, and my speakers did so well on time, so we have some time for questions. Uh, since this uh, session is being recorded, could you please come to the microphone if you have questions and comments? No questions, comments? Okay, well, then I'm going to turn back to my, discuss, uh, my speakers, and I want them to tell me in one minute what they think about this whole topic of financial inclusion and where we're going. Uh, so the final word, uh, each one of them. I'll start with Anna again. And, uh, um, so I think uh, uh, I want to link to the uh, final presentation. You know, there is a movement of money and of people. Um, and this is really literally very important. Uh, we really need people um, to use uh, and to be able to transfer money to use financial services. And I do think that we need services which are much targeted to their needs. And so we need to start from the bottom up. And uh, to do so, I think we need to understand what are the needs of people and also equip the people with the skills and the knowledge that's so important for them to make the best use of those financial services. And I want to, again, highlight what we are talking about here, which is, you know, this, this can uh, fight poverty, it can fight hunger, it can, um, it can improve financial well-being. So there is a lot at stake, and I really hope that policymakers will pay a lot of attention to this topic. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I guess going to the theme of uh, you know, digital services and the problems of digital services for financial inclusion. So, so clearly, you know, digital services can, you know, as, as we've seen, you know, do reduce the cost dramatically of accessing these services. So this is, and I, I guess I want to raise a bit of a, a cautionary uh, tail here. So for some services, this is great for, for savings, uh, insurance, uh, you know, having insurance in your mobile phone as opposed to, 
you know, going, having to go to a broker uh, 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 might, might, might improve. But, but for credit, for example, I mean, you know, this ease of accessing credit, um, uh, you know, should, I think should give us a big, a big pause. I mean, I, th there, there's some study in Africa uh, where I saw someone present that basically, um, you know, the nice thing about this digital, uh, you know, accessing credit uh, through the mobile phone is that, you know, the, the, the decision to, to give this credit is actually um, automated. So they, they have automated credit scoring, especially if you, if you have mobile services already, they can, they can use this information to, to better tailor this product. But basically, you know, you, you can actually borrow, and this is a, sort of a selling point, at any point in time. And so apparently the loans that were taken out at 3 a.m. in the morning had higher default rates. So, so, so you know, while ease is great, uh, you, know, um, you know, it's unclear whether we might need some cooling off period, uh, uh, you know, when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to credit. But, but um, actually, I did have a question based on uh, Anna, Anna Maria's presentation. So I guess I, what I'm interested in here is, you know, the, the relationship between usage of a financial uh, product and financial literacy. So do we see that, you know, through usage, people um, are better at using the product? So, so I guess, you know, I guess this goes back to the, to, you know, to what you told us about these millennials that use the, use the mobile phone quite, quite consistently, and yet they, you know, they seem to be overdrafting, they seem to be making these mistakes. So I guess my point is, is through usage, um, you know, are they correcting this? Are they learning? Are they correcting these mistakes? And are they therefore uh, b making better decisions? Or, or is, this, is this sort of a lost cause? I mean, I, I think this I is... Anna, you yeah. want to take that? Sorry. So we are not yet able to answer this question because we have not followed people over time and right. we are not really doing, again, well, we cannot address causality yet. But if I look at the evidence, for example, of financial literacy uh, around the age, you know, so if you look at people who have made a lot of financial decisions, so people at age 50 or even close to retirement, we actually, we don't see high, a high level of knowledge. So I am afraid that, you know, usage helps, but it doesn't give you a huge jump. In other words, you know, if you do this over and over and over, um, I don't know that, you know, you literally will be able to understand even concept like interest compounding, because it is, after all, a complex concept. And some concept, I think, are sufficiently complex, and that's why you know we learn physics in school, and we just don't learn by watching the world around us. And if the uh, apple falls, you know we understand the law of gravity or can articulate it. So you know I I do think there is an advantage in usage, but use, usage alone, in my view, is not enough. And I want to echo I think what you said, which is that you know making things very easy. Uh, can facilitate some behavior, uh, certainly, but if the behavior is about borrowing, um, which charges very high interest rate, then what you facilitate might make people worse off rather than better off. So making payment very easy um, is, is a little bit of a problem because, you know, in the past, even when we went from cash to credit card, the fact that you were using plastic versus cash make the payments less painful. Right? And so, you know, some people argue has created more spending. Now you're using the phone, which is something you love. So making payments is not painful at all anymore. You know, and so this might actually push people to buy more rather than less. And that's why we might see them not having savvy behavior. And that's why I think technology is really great, but is making things easier. Combine that with little financial literacy, you might end up making some people worse off rather than better off. Having said that, there are enormous opportunity for technology, of course, but I think you know, technology alone is not enough. So may I ask the panel, before I continue with Leora, uh, what are some of the policies that you think that developing countries should adopt to, to make the most of technology? Any one of you. Well, I'm going to start with my um, usual recommendation, which is that we really need to have financial literacy in the schools. You know, in the same way in which we are improving education, 
general education is critically important, and I think even more in this more complex world, but I think we also need to add that specific knowledge. Um, and I think this would be a really good way to equip people with this, basically with these basic tools uh, to be able to operate in the financial market. And you know, we have seen from the global survey that this knowledge is really lacking, and this I think can be an impediment to be able to use financial services and the technology better. And this is, I think, really urgent because today you can make transfer with the click of a button. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a sense, your opportunities um, to make good decision but also bad decision have really increased. And so in a digital world, I think knowledge and financial knowledge, in my view, is even more essential. Thank you. Can I? So uh, I, I actually, I think I mentioned it in the, in the presentation, but I'll, I'll say it again, because it's, it's very important. Um, so, but one of the things, so, so we, there's a companion paper to the one I presented where we looked at, um, you know, the kind of, the information that, that um, clients or prospective clients were given about the costs of financial products, right? So, so this was an audit study where we sent people out to ask for credit or savings, and then we let the, the staff talk uh, and, and present the, 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 you know, make the case for a particular product, and then we recorded how much of the total cost you were actually recorded. So to look at precisely that, to, to measure how much of the cost of the, pro, of the product you were actually recorded, we had to know the full cost of the, pro, of the, of the products. So after this exercise, this audit study, we had to go back to the web pages of every bank and match the product that you were offered with the product offered in the web page, and basically uh, collect all the cost information for these products. This was a very painful and expensive exercise. So, it, it, you know, it, it, it's 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 surprising how how little information there is about the the, the cost of products in on the websites. Or, uh, in fact, we actually had to go and talk to the staff uh, now with you know with the help of the of the regulators. And so, one of the things that that, that regulators could do is basically uh, uh, force uh, 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 banks uh, to actually disclose information. So actually put, again, put data, put the cost of, the, of their products in a, in a readable format so that then there's you know, developers, app developers uh, that can basically uh, you know, do, do these comparison websites uh, 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 to, to, to increase transparency. And this is, you know, not only for credit, for savings, but also, you know, uh, uh, you know remittance services, for example, uh, mobile money services, so that, mm -hmm. so that you know, people understand uh, the cost and, and so they can go on to these, to these sites and then, and then basically, uh, you know, find their best products given, given their needs, right? So I think, and, and this is actually has to come from the regulators, because otherwise, you know, we, we will not develop the industry if each of these uh, app developers has to go and, and, and create this database, right? This mm -hmm. back-end database of all the different products, yeah. right? So, yeah. Chavi, one of the very interesting findings of your paper is the, the, the impact of simplification versus financial literacy. Right. Given the relative costs of those doing these two things, what are some of your reactions? I just am um, trying to be provocative here. Uh, yeah, I don't want to pick up <laughs> here. Uh, no, but no, no, I, I, I think, think both, both are, of you I can... think, you know, both are, um, both are needed, but, 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 but I mean, yeah, so I, in fact, well, we're, so we've shown that in the lab this works. We're actually trying to work with some, with some, um, with some uh, regulators to actually uh, test it out in the, in the field. Um, and, and again, I mean, you know, uh, just by the way you disclose information, you know, people, people make, better, make better decisions. Now, of course, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, in the space of consumer protection is about enforcement. So you know uh, the the regulator can can say whatever they want, but then what happens on the ground uh, is 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 what's important, and, and and you know this is where also regulators would would have. But but I, you know my my suggestion would be you know given the results would be by all means not only regulate the 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 content but also the format, right? I mean make sure that and 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 mind you there are countries that are doing that. Uh, typically these are of course more developed countries, so Australia. Uh, New Zealand, England, um, you know, have, have, have tried some, some of these uh, initiatives. But, but yeah, I mean, the evidence suggests that this should, 
please. Anna yeah, Maria. and no, but I, I agree with you in a sense that you know these experiments are incredibly important to tell us how you can you know make progress in, mm -hmm. in some areas. And so I really do think that you know the paper by Ravi shows you know simplification can be very important and can be very cost effective. But I don't think it takes away from the importance of financial literacy, even though you, know, you can do better. Because you know, of course, if you target a specific topic, mm -hmm. you know, and if you concentrate the attention on that, then you can you know, provide something that addresses that problem. The problem is you have only addressed that, and you have not addressed the other. And the paper shows there that you, know, it, you have been able to address the problem of credit, but not the problem of savings. Mm -hmm. But financial literacy, and in, in, in those estimates as well, does actually both. And so what I think is one big advantage of financial literacy, it provides you those skills that are helpful in saving, credit, debt, and all the other uh, topics. While, of course, if you direct directly on a specific topic, then you might be able to solve this, but you don't solve the other. And there is also a concern, which I think we see more and more, and you know, some of your paper also show that, um, and also the paper by Leora, that you know, by addressing one problem, you might do create another. Mm -hmm. So we saw this, for example, I think in savings. You know, we can automatically enroll people into savings, and we might have people save more, but then those people might borrow more. Right? So we have addressed the saving more, but then we have created another problem. So that's why you know, financial literacy can try to mitigate that, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that these other interventions are not important. But this or and or is not a good strategy. I think we need Thank all you. of those things. Thank you. Jonathan is trying to come in, I think, earlier. Just had a comment on um, on regulation, which is that the same kind of regulation that we're looking to here in the U.S. Um, really needs to be global, which is consumer protection um, regulation. It's huge need for it here, but also you know abroad. Basic issues like uh, data privacy, who owns data, all of these are unresolved and uh, sort of meta level. They don't affect product design, um, but they really are important both in terms of justice, but also the broader functioning of the economy. And the other part that we're wrestling with both here and abroad is the use of algorithms, machine learning, and the way that they can replicate and reinforce bias. And so you know, people are struggling with these, but they are particularly important for vulnerable populations that we're focused on um, in this panel. Just to add to yeah. that, I think the regulation actually does impact the product design in the sense of, for example, the move towards digitizing government transfer payments. Um, who are, it's often to the most vulnerable segments of society, um, and that those products need to be designed for people who are not only illiterate, but often innumerate. You know, even the basics of understanding to keep your PIN number private, recourse in the case of mechanical or human error, um, it, it's very important. And there's been, you know, we had done work in South Africa suggesting, this was many years ago, that the poor were losing up to 15% of their social payments to bank fees. And so, um, you know, making sure that these products are designed with the recipients in mind um, is critically important. Uh, Mexico is another example where the government uh, committed to digitizing their government transfer payments. Um, but so the banks opened accounts, but the banks didn't have the rural reach. And it was cheaper for the banks to bring, you know, bags of cash and disperse cash in rural areas rather than open branches and ATMs. Um, and again, an example where the government had tremendous, tremendous cost savings, but it was not necessarily designed with the recipients in mind. Sorry, sure. so, 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 sorry, Jonathan, I, I, so fascinating paper, but I guess, what the heck? I mean, so what, how, so I understand, so the price goes down uh, of remitting, so what, why, why are senders wor worse off? I mean, is this, is this something that you were expecting? I mean, is this, through more remittance, you're getting a better sense of how much money they're making, and so they can, they can exert more pressure to extract mm. more from the sender. What, what, what? Yeah. What? What's? Yeah. I mean, this is yeah. fascinating. But, but I mean, I guess I was not expecting. That. Yeah, what, what we see is consistent with certain models of reciprocity, right? So you, th it's one love, one model of reciprocity we have is that there's some sort of game, and that we are. You know, there are rents to be ahead here, and that the migrants and the household are just going to split their rents, and everyone's better off. So it's Pareto improving. But other models of reciprocity would suggest that 
you know, if you really care, if the migrant really cares about their family members back home, they actually may um, choose or be pressured to become worse off themselves, right? Which is totally consistent with what we see in um, lots of places. Yeah, this is a very interesting example of the potential pitfall of technology. We always talk about the promise of technology, but adding to what you were just saying, this is a very interesting and unintended impact. And so any more thoughts on that, Jonathan? Or Leora, <laughs> for Sorry. that matter. So, so through revealed preference, these guys continue to, to migrate, uh, or, or given this technology, I mean, so, or is there, is there some opposition, actually, of the senders to actually use the service? Uh, n so, you know, what, you know, yeah, so, so is it that, you know, they're, they're worse off, but then, you know, through altruism, they're, you know, in utility terms, they're, they're, they're you know, they're equally, equally yeah. better off, or, or what? Or, yeah. Overall, what yeah. do we see? Exactly. What you're it's asking. An, it's, so an are we... of, it's an interesting set of questions. And you know, bear in mind that households that are sending money back to are extremely poor, suffering from hunger. And so you know, the possibility to help you know, family members is a very strong impulse. On the other hand, this is a one-year um, you know, impact. I think about Leora's work here, um, where you're seeing when factory workers receive digital payments, they're saving more. And maybe that's going to be the long run uh, impact, more separation, more saving by factory workers, less sending um, back to villages. But the short run impacts that we're seeing here are very clearly um, in the direction of just sending much bigger remittances. Right. Leora, were you trying to say something? Um, no, I guess I'm a little um, more skeptical of the altruistic per reasons and simply that it's easier for family back home now to demand money to be sent quickly and cheaply. Yeah. You know, last, you know, in the past they said, well, I'll be traveling <coughs> excuse me, next month to the village. Now you can get the money immediately. Um, which also highlights, so, you know, I, I think the literature really shows as the benefits of digital payments to give greater, you know, not only security, but privacy and control over your money. Um, and, you know, I, I like to think of the most important payment as being payment to oneself in the, in the uh, way of savings, um, which again goes back to the importance of, for example, auto deposit commitment savings. It'd be interesting to overlay that with your workers. And, and uh, we've been doing follow-up work in both Ghana and Bangladesh in slightly different contexts and understanding how much people value the public nature of a commitment savings product, um, how much people value keeping their wages private from other family members. Um, for example, it's, it's quite easy in the garment, in, in many industries, in tea plucking even, um, base salaries are known by the family, but no one really keeps, time of, keeps track of overtime. Um, and that's more private when you have these digital um, payments made. Um, so, so again, I think understanding when we're designing the products, how we can allow the workers to benefit from that privacy control um, a, a feature, a design feature. We have a question from the floor. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Marta from uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Um, it's not really my area, um, developmental economics, but uh, I have a bit of a background from Ukraine originally, and I'm just curious about this uh, last study. I would take it from uh, perhaps the really, the poorest countries of the world to perhaps, um, I don't know, less poor, but still developing countries, and ask the question of whether, can you really build an economy based on remittances? And I mean, um, when you talk about the really poor villages in Bangladesh, um, and, uh, and uh, talk about the transition from rural to urban, in the end of the day, we're still gonna uh, have to feed the world, and that relies on the rural populations, right? So then, um, by sending money back home, it's one way of you know having the short-term impact. But the productivity of those rural populations are ultimately gonna drive you know our ability to grow food and um, kind of make them sufficiently productive to. Uh, you know, produce the, the kinds of goods and services that we need in cities. So um, I, I guess the, the, the short question is really, you know, this remittance-based economies and, uh, and where, well, what are the implications of these things? Thank you. Jonathan, I guess this goes to you, and you can take the opportunity to talk about your closing thoughts, too. 
Yeah, I guess I would think of it as in a somewhat different frame, right? which is that Bangladesh's economy is growing, growing steadily, and it's centered in the cities. And that growth, those gains from growth, are not diffusing throughout the country. And so what these technologies are doing is allowing those, those gains to diffuse into rural areas. Now, there's a question about what's happening in rural areas, but in many ways, you know, this is an addition, right? People are still in rural areas, they're trying to work. This is bringing more resources into those areas, and we are seeing more investment, more self-employment, et cetera. So in fact, this is, I think, complementary, or should be complementary to rural growth, or could be complementary you know, if policies are designed in the right way. Um, okay. Leora wanted to jump in with her closing thoughts oh, now. No, I, was just <laughs> okay. I was just gonna close by bringing us back to something Asla talked about at the beginning, which is the grow a growing gender gap in access and use of financial services, especially in some South Asian, North African countries, um, where the growth was really driven by technology, a combination of biometric identification, bank agents, mobile agents, and what we're seeing since 2014 to 17, which was sort of both surprising and distressing, um, was large growth based on commitments by the government, by leveraging technology, but all that growth going to men and women really being left behind. Um, when we look more carefully, we're finding, you know, first of all, gender gaps in documentation, especially in many West African countries. We're seeing big gaps in access to technology. We have a new question in Global Findex on, do you personally have a mobile phone? Um, we find you know, Nigeria to Pakistan, more, men more than twice as likely as women to have even a phone. Um, this is a combination of social norms, how household spending is uh, um, appropriated, but it's also some subtle cultural norms. In Bangladesh, for example, um, to access your mobile money account, you need to give out your phone number. And most mobile agents are men, and women simply don't want to give their phone number to a strange man, um, which is a tremendous barrier. And so I think as we're looking to the future of leveraging technology even further, it's really important to make sure that women especially, who you know, perhaps are the most to gain by this greater control over their money, aren't being left behind. Thank you. And any more thoughts from you, Jonathan? That's my, my final thought as the yeah. grandfather of microfinance um, <laughs> is that maybe it doesn't need to be said, but I think there was, there was a hope early on that, you know, as governments are not stepping up, that financial services, financial inclusion could really play a major role in reducing global poverty. And I think, you know, as we get to where we are now, we really have a different way of thinking about it, which is, of course, that governments are, are really important. Government safety net programs, anti-poverty programs, and that these are really complementary activities that build from um, those government programs and uh, are not substitutes. Well, thank you very much. As you can see, this is an area of active research and much more to come in the next years. Please stay tuned and please join me in thanking the, our panelists for such a wonderful discussion.